Welcome to Bullshift the Podcast. My name is John DeGuy. I'm the host of the podcast and the author of the book, Bullshift. We're here to talk about behavioral finance as it pertains to decision making for ordinary retail investors and with a particular in, uh, influence on optimism bias and how that affects the way people make decisions. Thanks for joining us. My guest this week is Derek Dedman. Derek is the has a master's degree in personal finance from Kansas State University. He's both a CFA and a CFP charter holder. He's a member of the Ottawa CFA Society and a member of the F, of FP Canada's Assumptions Projections Guidelines Committee, where he is currently serving as the chair, which is why he's here with us this week. Derek is also the president of the board for the Caring and Sharing Exchange, which is one of Ottawa's oldest registered charities. Derek, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm uh, excited to chat with you today. A lot of the people listening in today might not be familiar with the FP Canada uh, Financial Planning Assumptions Guidelines. They come out every year at the end of uh, at the end of April, and uh, you've been doing it for many many years. You've been on the committee for many years, and you've taken over as the chair. Could you maybe begin by telling people about what these guidelines are, how they've come about, and maybe a little bit about the methodology? Absolutely. Uh, so the guidelines themselves has been uh, they've been published since I think 2009. Uh, this is my fourth or fifth year on the committee, and as you mentioned, I am I took over as the chair. Um, they I believe came about. I mean, I wasn't there when they first uh, the discussions and 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 uh, everything behind the the idea of why they would come about. But uh, my kind of assumption is that. Uh, it had to do with the fact that that there wasn't really a uh, evidence-based uh, resource out there when it came to the assumptions that were being used in financial planning projections. Uh, and I think those of us in the industry would be aware of maybe you know back in the time when uh, it was a bit of the wild west. I think when when what was being used, um, you know, and you know, we know with any kind of financial modeling, the uh, the whole garbage in, garbage out kind of scenario. And, and uh, um, you know, so I think having something and, and FP Canada being looked upon as kind of the, um, you know, the the the, the place uh, where this would be, you know, to, you know, I can't speak, I, again, I'm not as an employee of FP Canada, I can't really speak to exactly what the, the reason was, but, you know, being the, the the cf the the home of the cfp and and the, you know the the gold standard of financial planning in this country and i think globally as well i think they kind of saw that as an opportunity to kind of come in and and be the voice of reason i guess and uh and so i think that's that's why uh, they came about and um you know and the methodology behind it it's it's kind of evolved over time and grown over time but um you know, using uh, kind of a mix of uh, forecasting and backcasting, I guess, is kind of the way it, it's it's done, and it, looking at a way that's kind of reasonable, uh, consistent, and and uh, and transparent. And I think that's something that the uh, protection and assumption guidelines do do well. Uh, is that um, you know, with the projections themselves, you know, comes the addendum, and so you know, very easy if you want to kind of go down that rabbit hole and 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 look at each kind of data point and, and how it's there and why it's there and kind of how it contributes to the overall package. So it's become a little more granular as well. Up until a few years ago it used to be to the nearest one quarter of one percent and now mm -hmm. it's to the nearest one tenth of one percent for the different asset classes and things. And I should also mention that in addition to the assumptions guidelines for rates of return for different asset classes, it also has assumptions for things like yearly maximum pensionable earnings and inflation rates and also assumptions guidelines with regard to actuarial questions. So how long you're expected to live if you're yeah. a certain age now and all of which are um, ingredients to uh, having a r robust and, and fulsome financial plan because all of these things are considerations that you have to uh, bear in mind when you're when you're projecting what uh, what the future might hold, which is inherently by nature, by definition, uncertain. Very much. So yeah. So as you say, it, it used to be the Wild West, and now it's becoming a little more uh, codified. Yeah. Uh, what's your experience about uh, the firms that use it and the and the planners that use it? How how uh, how routinely is it uh, referenced when people start writing financial plans in Canada? Well, I don't, I mean, that's hard to know. I do know there are some, you know, financial planning softwares out there and stuff that kind of, 
either introduce the concept of the, the, uh, the, the guidelines. Um, you know, I think SNAP projections, they actually introduce in their software, you have the ability to kind of download them, use those as your assumptions. So, uh, you know, it'd be interesting. I don't think, you know, as far as I know, I know it's not really the committee's purview, but I don't know if FP Canada has kind of maybe surveyed or looked at, I know they publish it and they, you know, there's a press release every year when it comes out, but my assumption is that it's probably not as widely accepted as we like or widely used or even widely as known as we like. And, um, you know, I'm sure adoption has gone up incrementally every year, um, you know, but uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, if it's, you know, how measured it is of, of kind of how accepted it is. And right. you know. One of the things I talk about in my book, Bullshift, is the optimism bias that's part and parcel with the financial services industry. Mm -hmm. And part of that optimism is that a lot of people would just as soon not refer to the guidelines because they the guidelines are a bit of a downer because the expected mm -hmm. returns are oftentimes between say six and seven percent on the equity side and maybe three or three and a half percent to the most four percent on the income side and again they change every year but they usually only change by one or two tenths of one percent uh, right. because long-term projections uh, you know by definition even if you're looking at 30 years 29 of those years will be the same as what were used in last year's projections so there's really no reason to expect the numbers to change by very much right. um, the wonder the, the, the concern that i have and i'm wondering if you could weigh in on this and again this is just your personal opinion derek yeah. i'm not asking i'm not putting <laughs> you on the spot uh, well at least i'm not putting you on the spot in terms of uh, uh, trying to represent FP Canada because right. that, that's not what you're doing here. Right. Your impression, uh, for those people who are not using the guidelines, uh, what what kinds of numbers would you say they're using, say for, for Canadian equity or US equity over in the projections they would do for clients? And how would they differ from, from the numbers that are in the in the guidelines? Yeah, I mean I would I would would assume, and again this is just my own view i mean this is nothing to do with even the, the work as the committee we don't kind of survey to see what's out there or what kind of but just my own uh kind of professional view of talking to other professionals like i would assume that you know when it comes to even equity returns like you know probably in the eight to you know plus range i mean uh, somewhere even in the double digits still i think some might might be looking at um and you're right i mean you, you talk about optimism bias and i think for one that's probably Part of the reason these were needed in the first place and and you know and then i think if we talk about maybe why the acceptance or why the you know why they haven't been as widely accepted as as we'd like i think that's part of it and uh you know if you look at the kind of return that you would you would calculate as a balanced investor let's say uh using the the guidelines and you factor in fees it's it's quite you know low and um you know and that's uh maybe not uh, a selling feature for some if, if some are in front of the clients and and i think you know optimism bias for sure would be something that we kind of at play uh in in you know keeping people from adopting these or using them or bringing them up with clients or having them as part of their plans on a day-to-day -day basis the irony of course is that there's a widely accepted uh, viewpoint that financial planning has massive value for ordinary households and that people, and there's a lot of research that shows that people who have financial plans are more comfortable, they're happier, they're more confident in their future. Uh, the irony, of course, is if you have a financial plan, that's that's uh, assuming that you can get eight or nine percent on a balanced portfolio, uh, then that comfort might be a bit of a might be mis, uh, misplaced in some ways Absolutely. because it's because it's uh, you're assuming a rate of return which. Uh, might very well be uh, what's assumed might very well be considerably higher than what you experience, yeah. and then you think you're going to retire with 1.2 million, and you only you know retire with 820 thousand dollars, and and suddenly yeah. wait wait a minute, I only have 70 percent of what I ex expected or whatever, yeah. and 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 now uh, and now now what am I going to do? Because you yeah. you know you you've, you've planned at a, to a certain level, and now you're 65 or whatever, and you're retired. It's like so now what can we do? And that's the sort of risk that that most people don't really think about. You know, they, they yeah. say if I do the process and if you if I do the planning, then I'm going to be fine because everything is fine. But as you said a moment ago, it's garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And so it's it's fascinating. I wanted to ask you about how things 
change from one year to the next. So for instance, let's say we have a really good year for one asset class. So that, I'll just use this as an example. Let's say the expected return for Canadian equity is 6.5%. And we have a year where Canadian equity does 12%. Uh, sometimes a year later, uh, the expected return for Canadian equity might still be 6.5% or sometimes even higher. Right. Why is that? Uh, like as far as within the guidelines or just in general, do you mean? Well, I'm trying to understand why the guidelines, how they change incrementally from year to year. And if you assume that there's going to be a regression to the mean, and if, again, just hypothetically, 6.5% is the long-term expected average, and, and it's a 30-year number, and you have one year, and the, the most recent year that you've just experienced is substantially better, and the 6.5 number was, was the right number a year ago, then it would logically follow that maybe the right number for going forward might be 6.3 or 6.4, but sometimes that's not the case. Can you maybe explain why we might have these seemingly anomalous and incongruous readings from one year to the next? I think that just has to do with the, you know, kind of the factors that are considered. Um, you know, the methodology itself is, is you know, pretty standard from year to year, um, you know, and when it comes to the case of uh, equity returns, you know, uh, one of the factors that is considered is the kind of the 50 year average, um, you know, that, of course, wouldn't be impacted greatly by a, a one year, um, you know, change or, or, you know, that would be a, a small, small potential factor. Um, it could be to do with the, you know, the, um, the ongoing or the kind of more forward looking factors that are that are taken into, um, which as we know, one is the, you know, the actuarial report from the CPP and QPP. Um, one one potential reason is that, you know, we know that 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 report only comes out every three years. So that is kind of, um, you know, that factor. And that's just, you know, that is, you know, one of the kind of uh, um, inputs to to the guidelines. And we know that that comes out every three years. So you know, that's a pretty static thing from, you know, every three years. And then it's the kind of forward looking, um, you know, the survey that that's done. And, and that would probably be the biggest, I guess, potential impact for the year to year when it comes to that number. That would, I would assume. And, and you know, I mean, looking at that, you know, that, yeah, that, that would, I guess, have the, the most kind of potential um, impact to kind of that year to year um, jump that might be somewhat of impacted by kind of the most recent history right where where there is a potential that kind of the recent most recent year would impact kind of the um you know the outcome of those uh of those numbers i guess but yeah one of the other things that is becoming increasingly important in financial planning circles and in, and in personal finance in the, the 2020s is the risk of longevity people mm -hmm. are becoming increasingly clear that not only are return expectations lower than they had for for the future lower than what they have been in, in our lives up until now but simultaneously life expectancy continues to creep upward and we're at the point now where i think if you look at uh, the, the the tables that, that are part and parcel with the guidelines will show you with uh, oftentimes with a 10 percent and a 25 percent uh, confidence as to you know what what number of Canadians at a certain age will live to be what age, mm -hmm. and if you can make it to age seventy, I think there's about a ten percent chance you'll make it to age ninety four if you're mm -hmm. a man and about ninety six if you're a woman, and uh, you know that's considered to be a prudent uh, planning guideline. So just yeah. to split the difference, if you're age seventy, there's a reasonable chance that you might have another twenty five years of life left in mm -hmm. you. And uh, a lot of people don't think about that. They, they sort of plan for, uh, will I have enough for when I retire? And they think of retirement as being what their parents or grandparents experienced, yeah. which is oftentimes five to 10 years. Any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. And, and just recently, I can't even, I wish I, I noted this or where I, where I read this, but it was in a blog post somewhere, but it was, uh, it was kind of data on that. And, and can't remember the exact number, but it was something like the average Canadian underestimated their longevity by, you know, five years or something like that. I mean, and it, I don't know if that's kind of the op opposite of optimism bias when it comes to uh, longevity. I mean, I think 
we we tend to assume we're not going to live as long as we do and yeah. and so i do i think there's a great great risk that way um you know and as we know when we're when we're planning or when we're you know and i can only speak to me and in practice but um i would much rather be on the conservative side and and you know planning for um you know plan for the plan for the worst hope for the best kind of thing i guess but no i i think i think that is a huge factor and i think there is there is increased risk there and like you said we have you know uh decreasing rates of return over time and we have you know significantly kind of longer life expectancies and 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 also you add to other kind of structural factors the fact that most of us and many of us will never have or won't have a defined benefit pension that kind of is has the ability to um you know uh, kind of deal with that longevity risk or take that out uh we know that uh, you know even though annuities could for many people be a benefit you know there is an aversion to to new annuities and 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 kind of other ways to to handle some of that uh longevity risk so yeah i think it i think it's a concern and i'd like to think and hopefully that that things like the projection assumption guidelines would kind of bringing in more reasonable assumptions and, and actually looking at facts and looking at, at you know, having something evidence-based would, would, you know, kind of uh, help with that and, and help consumers and, and mostly and help financial planners also ensure that they're using something defensible and something reasonable when it comes to that. Because, um, you know, I know the guidelines aren't necessarily perfect, mind you, in our addendum this year, we did have a, um, we included a new chart this year that kind of showed, um, you know, with our major with inflation and with the with the bonds and with the equity returns, kind of how our guidelines have have projected over time, you know, neck neck with reality. And it was, you know, it it definitely showed, um, you know, that it's a very reasonable, um, you know, the assumptions have been, you know, within you know a margin of error uh, there. Um, so, and it's one of those things that it, in the absence of 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 the guidelines, you know, what are people using? And and quite often, I think they're kind of more on the optimistic side. And, and yeah, I, I think we could have a discussion about how optimism can take different shapes and forms when it comes to longevity. Because on the one hand, uh, you can say that you're being optimistic uh, that you're that you're not going to run out of money. On the other hand, maybe the reason you're optimistic you're not going to run run out of money is because you're pessimistic about how long you're going to live, yeah. or, right. or maybe you're just oblivious to the facts as yeah. to what the actuarial standards uh, are. Right. One example of that as well, again, is when people take their Canada pension plan. Uh, you know, CPP mm -hmm. is, is an optional. You can take it anywhere between age 60 and age 70. Right. And most people uh, take it at age 65 or earlier. Relatively few take it later. And only about 1% right. of the population waits until age 70, even though mm -hmm. actuarially speaking, once you live beyond age 82 or 83, you actually get the most money out if you wait until age 70 before you start right. taking the money out. Right. So I think what, what that to me, what that shows is that the, the financial planning uh, community has not done as good a job of convincing Canadians of, of the very real risk of longevity. Uh, hmm. To the point where it's become salient, and and where Canadians understand that, and and maybe maybe the problem is not with the planners, maybe it's with the finance industry in general, maybe it's um, public policy makers. I don't know. I suppose you could point the finger at any number of people, but at any rate, there's no doubt that there's a problem that um, you know people are assuming they're going to have enough money to retire because they're wearing rose-colored glasses about what right. that all entails. Yeah, absolutely. I I totally agree with that and you know it is uh you know it's something that that should uh, be out there more and it is definitely a concern and and uh you know i think what's interesting and I, again i i should have uh I, I meant to take note of this but you know i think just recently there was actually a for the first time where the projection assumption guidelines were actually used as evidence in a in a case because it was it was you know and i think you know, to your point, I think there's going to be more and more of this, uh, especially knowing kind of what was happening in the past with, you know, clients who had worked with a planner or advisor, whoever, and was told, hey, you're going to retire with X amount of money, and this is why, and this is everything's good, and using some, you know, potentially outlandish or unrealistic assumption, and then when that doesn't happen, kind of going and, you know, taking that to uh, the regulators or to court or whatever that may be, 
and and needing as a planner, needing as an advisor to kind of be able to have evidence of well, why, you know, why did you use this number? And I think just saying, well, it's what the software recommended or it's what the return was the year before or whatever, I don't think that's gonna that's not gonna cut it when it when it comes to it. And I think um, you know, I think that, that goes with that goes with the the longevity, you know, the mortality that goes with the rates of return that goes even with uh, inflation assumptions and everything. I mean, it's, you know, I think you just need to have something to, to back or to use as a base of, of why you are making these assumptions and what you're using. And, you know, we say if you're not using ours or you're not using the, the projection assumption guidelines, what are you using and why? I think that would be kind of the question that I'd always be asking. One of the things that the guidelines does is it, it includes uh, examples of what a what a balanced portfolio might look right. like, and it shows you how you can disaggregate, you know, into the constituent parts: five percent cash and forty-five percent yep. Canadian bonds, and uh, you know, thirty percent uh, Canadian stocks and twenty percent uh, foreign or American stocks or what have you. And then you have different rates of returns for each, and you prorate them all, right. and it spits out a number at the bottom in terms of what the expected return would be. And a balanced portfolio might come in somewhere around 5%, you know, maybe it's 4.8, maybe it's 5.1, I don't know, but somewhere yeah. around 5%. And I, the sense I get is that most people, um, if, you, if you tell them that 5% is the rate of return you might reasonably expect, they would bristle at that because mm -hmm. uh, the, the assumptions have been dropping over time. Absolutely. And so that's a very real concern. But I wanna get to, this is, as you may recall, one of my favorite bugaboos, uh, is that the, the the assumptions guidelines also includes a, a phrase at the bottom of page three or four saying these are the assumed rates of return for for benchmarks for for asset classes mm -hmm. for financial planning purposes you need to reduce those expectations by the costs incurred and that that includes both the product costs so yeah. if you're using mutual funds or ETFs or even trading costs for individual stocks as well as the cost of advice if you're getting advice if you're working with a with a, an investment advisor, a financial planner, or someone who's charging you a fee, perhaps based on assets. Right. So when you when you think of it that way, um, most people that use mutual funds are paying probably over two percent as a blended management expense ratio for the funds. And even if you're charging, if you're working with an advisor who's charging, say, a point or a one one and one quarter percent. Uh, and then using, let's say, ETFs, exchange traded funds on top of that, and they they cost on average, um, you know, uh, 50 or so uh, basis points, one half of 1%. It's right. not uncommon to be paying, say, one and three quarters percent uh, as a blended cost for yeah. that. So what most people are paying, uh, I find, is at least one and one quarter percent for uh, products and advice. And, and in many instances, as much as two and a quarter percent. So let's right. split the difference and call it one and three quarters percent. Okay. If you have a balanced portfolio that's earning you about 5% before fees and your fees are, are an additional one and three quarters percent. Uh, first off, the fees are eating up more than one third of your return. Did yeah. you realize that? Yeah. And then secondly, uh, the net effect is that your expected return for planning purposes is not the 5% blend for the uh, weighted average of the asset classes, but it is that number minus the fees, which in this case is five minus 1.75, which is three and a quarter percent. Yeah. How many people realize that three and a quarter percent is a reasonable return expectation on a advised portfolio, which is a balanced, say, 60% stocks, 40% yeah. asset mix? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know, but probably not enough. And, and, um, you know, I know we've chatted, John, about this before, and I know you, you know, you've been a supporter, but also, uh, I don't want to call it a critic, because that's not the right word, but, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, what would be the right word, John? To, uh, I'm a person who's trying to make it better, and, and uh, yeah. so what I would say is, uh, you folks do fantastic work. You know I love the work you do. Yeah, it's, absolutely. it's that we're not, I don't think we're doing uh, enough to sort of ring the alarm bells to help people realize that uh, the assumptions they're using are are unduly optimistic and as a result somewhat unrealistic and and right. there's a real risk of being overly optimistic in in your yeah. planning absolutely no and and I know and I know the whole you know the discussion of fees and and I think at least for my entire time with the committee you know it was always at least addressed um, but I think something you brought up and I know that that we've kind of listened and tried to learn from is that maybe it wasn't addressed enough 
Um, you know, and if you look, um, you know, if you look at the documentation, if you look even at the example that's given at the end, uh, you know, it's it's front and center. Um, I can point to now, you know, and I would uh, multiple points and multiple kind of uh, times in the documents and the addendums themselves where it talks about where it's important, like it's fees, and it's very clear that this is, you know, this is gross of fees numbers. All these assumptions do not account for fees. They do not account for advice fees. They do not account for product fees. So that needs to be addressed and need to be taken off. Um, you know, so is it, you know, again, I, I don't know. I can't speak for everybody out there. I, I My assumption would be, unfortunately, it's probably not, you know, uh, as well understood or well accepted or well addressed as it should be, uh, especially when it comes to the fee stuff. Um, you know, but, you know, we do, it, we do take that seriously and it is something that, you know, we've tried to kind of get stronger with and with the wording and be clear because it is important. Like we would, you know, I would, I would agree and I'm sure everybody on the committee and it would agree as well that it is, it is very important and, and, you know, it kind of, uh, I guess the best way to put it, it would kind of take, take away, um, you know, from the importance of, or the validity of this, if, if people were using the assumptions with confidence and not factoring in the fact that there is a cost and there is a cost to advice and there is a cost to product and if you're if you're using assumptions without that and not dressing that yet that cost is pre present well then you know your your uh, your outcome isn't going to be you know correct or valid either right and so um, exactly yeah the, the irony of course is that there are lots of people who don't use the guidelines but even i guess my point is my my fear is that there's yeah. even a substantial number of people who use the guidelines who don't use them properly because yeah. they'll do the first step they'll they'll look at the weighted average but then they won't do the next step of, of backing out the costs which is also necessary to do everything properly i think and i'm curious what you think eric uh, i think that part of that is due to cognitive dissonance i think there are uh, people who work as as planners who want to do good work, but mm -hmm. they don't want to um, contemplate that the fees that they charge or the products that they recommend, which have costs, are having an impact on on their their clients' goals in a negative sense. Which is to say, you know, the higher those fees are, uh, the harder it is for the clients to reach their goals. All else being yeah. equal. Oh yeah, yeah, I could see that. You know, I could. I'm, there, there would be hard to argue that that wouldn't be a potential, you know, pitfall or out there. And, um, you know, knowing the industry and knowing that that definitely could be a concern. Um, you know, I, yeah, I could, I could see that. Um, you know, I don't know if, you know, if, you know, I think that, um, you know, a more open discussion about that kind of stuff and more client awareness and stuff is obviously important. I don't know if that's the, the, the duty of, of, our committee or even the duty necessarily of FP Canada. Like, I, again, I don't speak for them. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know how that could be addressed. I mean, you know, I know our mandate as a committee is really just to, to do what we can to ensure the validity to continue to publish these and, 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 you know, to, uh, you know, upgrade the mythologies where needed. And, and we do, you know, we do, we are tried aware of potential pitfalls or potential misuse. And I think that's why we did do stuff like really work at the, 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 you know, adding the language around that. I mean, um, you know, is it the regulators that need to come in and, and, and be more aggressive around this type of stuff? Like, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but yeah, I would, I would, you know, personally as a financial planner and, you know, who's been at this for, for well over a decade. Yeah. I I've seen it and heard it and, and know it's out there and, and uh, um, you know, but yeah, good question. You're, you know, I, I guess it's uh, you know, more, more, advocates like yourself that that kind of bring awareness to it and you know kind of shining a light on the potential pitfalls so consumers can be better prepared and ask better questions and um you know i mean it'd be a, a music to my ears to know if a, if a potential client goes to a, a financial planner's office and and potential is meeting with them and ask them well what assumptions do you use are you using these guidelines right. and are you taking you know what are your fees and and i've seen i mean i know our industry is um uh, you've got a long way to go and i know you'd agree with that i think that's why you do what you do and um you know i think there has been has been you know positive uh change though and continued change and i know i see it in practice in my practice you know i'm having client potential clients come in and ask better questions and when i first started i don't think 
I don't, you know, know if I had any clients kind of even knowing what the CFP was or what it meant. And now I have clients that will find me because I am a CFP or a CFA and that, you know, and I, so I think it's, it's awareness is kind of number one and, and you know, more educated consumers and everything. And uh, yeah, but like I said, I, I think it would be a, a, a dream to, to know that someone's walking into a planner's office and asking, are you a CFP professional? Yes. Great. What assumptions are you going to use in my plan when you do it? Yeah, I think that'd be awesome. Right. Yeah, I agree. All right. So we're drawing to the close here. So at the end of the, every podcast, I like to ask my guests uh, two questions, two segments. The first is something that, that is called, uh, uh, what, do we, what do we call it? No, we're, we're calling that's bullshit. <laughs> so that's bullshit is where I ask people to, uh, to talk about uh, anything that they think uh, is is wrong in the industry that they think could be improved upon. Uh, what 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 is it that sort of uh, stuck in your craw that bugs you the way certain things bug me? Oh wow, that's a good question. There's so many. Uh, again, just to you know, for uh, full kind of uh, compliance and disclosure and everything. Obviously, I'm always just speaking for myself. I'm not speaking yeah, on the behalf of, of uh, any committees or anybody else or even my employer. But. Um, yeah, personally, I think that, uh, um, you know, and this may be weird coming from me, but I think that our industry can be and still is a bit of an old boys club, and I'd like to see it uh, become a bit more diverse place. I still, you know, like going to events and everything, see it's just, you know, in the end, it's mostly men and, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, the industry itself is kind of... Uh, dominate that way i'd love to see it kind of become more diverse and 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 uh open to that way so i think that's one thing um yeah i don't know okay and then the other side and the other side because i'm sensitive to uh to anybody alleging that i'm just a, a negative guy all the time I, I i'm looking for positive solutions so the other the flip side of what i do at the end of the podcast is a segment i call shift happens if it was up to you and you could change uh, something, perhaps the diversity aspect of the business, but perhaps something else, what would you change and how? Oh, well, I can, add, I can, this is different than that, but I would say that, uh, oh, and I don't know if this would be popular or unpopular or what, but I would love to see our industry in a way be able to be you know, I don't know, move, move away, just a, a, a better kind of overall compensation model so that, um, A, so that a broader market can be served. Um, B, I just think too that, um, you know, unlike other kind of professional, uh, you know, other professions, um, you know, I think you're kind of limited sometimes in, into your entry into this profession and, and, you know, whether you're coming into a, you know, a commission based role or you're going into something else. It'd be nice if it was just, if there was more ways to come in and learn from experienced professionals, you know, have a, a living wage to start, not have to start with sales, just, you know, I, I guess the best way to put it to be able to start with knowledge, not, not start with having to sell, um, you know, cause it can be, and still is a very sales based kind of at least, entry into this profession and and uh um i don't know what the answer to that would be bigger firms you know base salaries you know and and i have no idea <laughs> i have no idea what the solution to that would be but i think that would be a real cool step um you know uh in in the kind of model of how things are done and i think that would also kind of widen the availability of uh of advice out there to kind of all aspects and all all kind of walks in life and demographics and everything too because i do i i'm i believe i think everybody should have a financial plan i think everybody should have access to financial advice um and uh but yeah I, i'm a i'm a yeah that's that's that that would be the dream that would be ideal do i have any way or knowledge or or <laughs> solution how that can happen no i don't <laughs> Amen to that. All right. Well, thank you, Derek. It's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, thank you for all you do. And perhaps yeah, we'll see you soon. Me. Absolutely. Thanks so much. John DeGuey is a portfolio manager in Toronto and the author of the book Bullshift, How Optimism Bias Threatens Your Finances. Bullshift is available online and in bookstores everywhere. The opinions expressed in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Bullshift, the podcast, is produced by TalkShoe, a division of IOTUM.